Hi, I'm Yun Zhu Li. Today, I'm going to talk about the research I have been doing over the past few years on the direction of learning structured word models from and for physical interactions. The goal of my talk today is that by the end of my talk, you'll be convinced that we should add structure to our learning systems. And with a suitable choice of structure, the system will have a much better sample efficiency and generalization capability, especially for complicated physical interaction tasks in the real world. In recent years, we have witnessed a tremendous amount of progress in the field of robotics. In certain restricted areas, robots start to become on par or sometimes surpass human performance. For example, the humanoid robots built by Boston Dynamics has clearly surpassed my personal capability of performing backflipping. Or in the self-driving domain, although we haven't seen a massive deployment of self-driving cars in our daily life, the field has moved a long way over the past few years. But what about complicated physical interactions with the environment? How far are we can we build robotic manipulation systems that can achieve human level manipulation capabilities? Here are examples of what's currently deployed in the industry for commercial uses, where robots typically handle relatively simple objects for pick and place tasks. Yet we humans can perform much more complicated manipulation tasks. For example, we can crack eggs, spread butter on a slice of bread, making dough and making sushi. And the key gaps between robots and humans' interaction capability are the ability to sense the environment from multiple sensing modalities like vision, touch, and sound, the ability to handle objects of different materials and adapt to new objects never seen before. We can also generalize to new task objectives. So how can we build robots with human level physical interaction capabilities? One way that people typically consider is model-free reinforcement learning. Model-free RL learns a policy function mapping from the state to action while trials and error with the environment. We have witnessed success stories in the gaming domain like AlphaGo and AlphaStar. However, when we deploy such a learning system in the real world for physical interactions, we will encounter problems like sample efficiency, where AlphaGo zero requires 3,000 years of interactions. We will also have safety concerns. For example, here is a learning process of an RL agent. Although the humanoid robot successfully moves forward at the end of this video, it will for sure cause safety issues when deploying such a learning process on a 200 pounds Boston Dynamics humanoid robot. Also, this is not how we humans do tasks. We do not need tens of millions of interactions before we can do every single task. Instead, we humans have these intuitive models of the world that predicts how the environment would change if we apply a specific action. For example, looking at the following two videos, although the manipulating objects are very different from each other, one is dove, the other is a pile of onions, we can effortlessly predict the effect of our action. For example, how the dove will deform and how the onion pieces will move around. The predictive ability then helps us plan our behavior in order to achieve a specific goal. To build such a predictive model, there are generally two ways of doing it. One is to learn the model from data. We can roughly categorize it as model-based reinforcement learning. The typical framework first maps the observation to a latent space Z and then learns a dynamics model predicting the evolution of the latent space. It can directly learn from partial observations and handle systems where the underlying physical equations are unknown. There are success stories like Mu Zero and controlling robots from pixels. However, most prior work assume that Z is a one-dimensional vector, which is unstructured and limited in terms of generalization. For example, when looking at a Play-Doh or a pile of coffee beans, we are not thinking of them as a single vector. Instead, we have a good understanding of the structure within the systems, the constituting components, and the relational dependency structure. The structured understanding of the environment is the key to allow us to handle objects with complicated physical properties. Talking about structure, the other way to build a predictive model is based on analytical physical equations, like F equals MA. 
This is arguably the most compact way to encode the structure and has excellent generalization. It is also extremely useful in constructing models for Boston Dynamics robots and rockets. However, such physics-based model relies on the assumption that full state information is available, which is often not the case for complicated physical interaction tasks. For example, in the onion manipulation tasks, estimating the states of each one of the onion piece is hard and sometimes impossible. Or for the shirt buttoning task, the physics-based model requires full state information of the clothes before it can simulate the buttoning process, whereas we humans only require local information to accomplish this task. So both methods have their pros and cons. The left is model learning, while the right is structures in the model. My research aims to bridge the gap and get the best of both worlds that nurse models with structures inspired by understanding of physics from physical interactions and for the robots to do better physical interaction. Specifically, my research focuses on physical interaction tasks with objects with complicated physical properties, like manipulating plasticisms, granular materials, pushing boxes in the face of external disturbances, and for viewpoint generalization of systems containing the coupling of fluid and rigid objects. To make the problem more concrete, we aim to minimize an objective function C defined over the observation Y and the action U. And we have to think through the three most critical constraints. The first one is a perception module that maps the observation to the scene representation Z. Then is the dynamics module that predicts the changes in the scene representation when given an external action U. Then is a control module that derives the control signal based on the scene representation to minimize the task objective. If you look closely, you will realize that the choice of theme representation D has a profound impact on the design of all components throughout the entire system. Thus, it is of paramount importance to think deeply on what kind of representation we should use for a given task and understand its implications about the system structure. In this talk, I would argue that there may not exist one fixed representation that works for all tasks and objects it is essential to understand the advantages and limitations of different representations and select the one that suits the best with the task at hand. I will also show how a suitable choice of representation and structure can lead to better generalization and sample efficiency. Specifically, I will talk about four types of representations at different levels of abstraction and discuss how they are suitable for the following manipulation tasks. Let's start with the manipulation of plasticisms, where we are using particles and graph neural networks, abbreviated as GNN, to model the dynamics. Particle as a representation are very general and flexible, which applies to objects of different materials, including rigid bodies, deformable objects, and fluids. As you can see from the images, different objects consist of particles which indicates the object's geometry and the interactions within and between the objects. One way to model the dynamics of interacting systems is to use graph neural networks, as has been done by many prior works. Yet, they typically focused on a small scale system consisting of at most 15 constituting components. Yet in our problem, we aim to model systems involving hundreds or even thousands of particles we need innovative techniques to be able to handle systems of this scale. Here is a graphical illustration of how graph neural networks work. The graph contains three nodes and three directed edges, which together is our theme representation Z. For each directed edge in the graph, we denote the sender as B and the receiver as A. An edge encoder takes the information on both the sender and the receiver and outputs an edge representation denoted as EK. Then for each node, we aggregate all the edge representation on edges where node A is the receiver. The aggregation is then combined with the node information and fed through a node encoder to derive the node representation. We can then define the loss function between the node or edge representation and the quantity we care to train the model. In our case, we care about the evolution of the state Hence, the loss function is a mean squared error between the node representation and the actual state at time t plus one. 
One thing to note is that we exploit the compositional nature of the system where the node encoder is shared among all nodes and the edge encoder is shared among all edges. Thus, the learned model can generalize to systems of different sizes or even outside the training distribution, as we will show later in the experiments. In our work, we introduced some improved techniques on the vanilla graph neural networks to improve the modeling power. First, we use multi-step message passing to propagate the information multiple steps over the graph to capture higher order interactions. Second, due to memory limits, constructing a fully connected graph over the entire particle set is inefficient and quickly becomes infeasible when the number of particles increases. We thus build dynamic graphs over the particle sets, where each particle will only connect to nearby particles that are within a certain distance. Since rigid objects are globally coupled, where a small perturbation on one corner of the object will instantly propagate to all particles within the object. We introduced a third augmentation that uses hierarchical graphs for rigid and deformable objects. More specifically, we cluster the particles and assign an additional parenting particle as the root of the cluster. This hierarchical design will enable a more efficient long distance message passing within the object. Here we list the modeling choices we use for objects of different materials. As we discussed before, we use hierarchical modeling for rigid objects. In order to maintain the rigidness of the object, we predict a global motion for the entire object and back project the movements to each particle. For deformable objects, we use hierarchical modeling, but the motion of each particle is predicted individually to model the deformation of the object. For fluids, we use dynamic graph building where each particle only connects to nearby particles and similar to the deformable objects, each fluid particle will also have its own motion. On the right, we show our model's prediction results where the inputs to our model are the initial positions and velocities of all particles our model can predict the long-term future and correctly capture the dynamics of the fluid and the interactions between the fluid and the rigid object. Here, we show some more results on our model's dynamics prediction. This example shows two fluids falling down and merging with each other, where the left is the ground truth and the right is our model's prediction. Again, our model is making open loop prediction where the inputs are just the positions and velocities of the particles at the first frame. As can be seen from the video, the prediction is very close to the ground truth. Here's another example where we grip a deformable material using two cuboids, which are to mimic the two fingers of a parallel gripper. Here we show an example of shaking a box of fluids. We assume that the container is fully actuated our model accurately predicts the long horizon future by taking in the particle state at the first frame and the subsequent actions for controlling the container's movements. As we have discussed before, all nodes share the same node encoder and all edges share the same edge encoder. Thus, our model can generalize to systems with more particles than during training. This example shows that our model can work in an environment containing two times more particles than during training. It is clear from the video that our model captures the wave of the fluid particles caused by the container's movements and maintains the density and incompressiveness constraints of the fluids. After we have obtained the dynamics model, how can we use it for control tasks? In this work, because the learned model is a neural network, which is naturally differentiable, where we can extract the gradients using off-the-shelf packages like PyTorch or TensorFlow, we can then use gradient descent to optimize the action signals and apply a model predictive control framework to account for the modeling error. More specifically, here we use the blue dots to represent the initial state of the systems. The goal is to achieve the target shown in red. We have an initial guess of the action sequence and use the learned model to predict the control outcome. We then define a loss function between the predicted outcome and the targets and then backpropagate the gradients of the loss function with respect to the action sequence. We then iteratively update the action sequence to minimize the distance between the predicted outcome and the target. The model may not be accurate enough, so we use model predictive control where we only execute the first action U0, 
then we obtain a new state v1 from the environment. We then re-optimize the action sequence u using gradient descent to give the model an opportunity to adjust its action sequence to account for the modeling error. The key to the success is to leverage the parallel computing power of GPU, where we can sample hundreds or even thousands of action sequences and do gradient descent for all of them simultaneously. This allows the planned trajectory to perform local refinements and at the same time, use sampling to get around some local optimum. Here we show our model's control results. The goal here is to shake the box of fluid, where the control signal is the position of the fully actuated container. When the countdown goes to zero, we want the shape of the fluid to match the target shape shown on the top left. And here is the control process. And here's the result. Here's another example. It is clear from the video that our model's dynamics modeling ability can help the container minimize the distance between the end state and the target. Here we show the control results in manipulating a deformable form. The decision variable of the control problem are the position, orientation, and the clipping distance of the parallel gripper. After two grips, the result roughly matches the target. Here's another example. We have also attempted to deploy our system into the real world by gripping this deformable object to achieve the target shape shown on the top left. In order to estimate the particle position from the perception data, we use a depth camera to scan the environments and fuse the point clouds to obtain a mesh of the environments, which is shown in blue on the top left. We then uniformly sample particles inside the surface of the object to obtain the current particle set for the model to control on. The sampled particle set is shown on the second row of the left column. Here is the control process. After three grasps, the resulting shape is closer to the target, demonstrating our model's understanding of the dynamics can help guide the controller's actions. Here we show two other examples of manipulating the form into simpler target shapes. The first row is a horizontal shape and the second row is a tilted shape. And here are the results. I want to emphasize that this is a very hard task of using our general purpose parallel gripper to manipulate a deformable form into an arbitrary shape. Later, I will show comparisons with humans controlling the robots to perform similar tasks. Part of me is a roboticist. What I care about the most are results in the real world. Here, I want to dig deeper into how we manage it to perform real world experiments. The key to the success of the previous method is to perform the theme to real transfer. We will learn the model from a physics-based simulator. To transfer to the real world, we use 3D reconstruction to obtain the shape and online adaptation to estimate the physical parameters like stiffness. However, we do not have a simulator that can simulate everything around us. We are then asking the question of whether we can remove the dependence on the physical simulator and directly learn the model from real data. In a recent follow-up work, I moved on to a supervising role and worked on a direct extension of the previous classism manipulation task where we want to learn the model directly from observation data using the setup shown on the left, and use the learned model to manipulate the plus systems to achieve more complicated target shapes, such as the X shown on the right. We first use the four RGBD camera to reconstruct the environment. Based on the reconstructed point clouds, we segment out the parts corresponding to the plus systems and the gripper, reconstruct the surface, and then sample points within it to construct the particle set. Similarly, we also predict the evolution of the particle set. The key difference between training the dynamics model from a simulator and the real data is the loss function. In a simulator, we know the one-on-one -on -one correspondence between particles in different time steps. Thus, we could use the mean squared error between the corresponding particles to supervise the model. When using the real data, since the particle sets are sampled individually for different time steps, we do not know the correspondence. We, therefore, 
use a combination of the chamfer distance and the earth mover's distance to measure the distance between the overall shapes instead of individual particles. The dark blue particle set shows open loop future prediction results using our NERD model, where the red dots indicate the gripper. Here we are using our NERD model to plan the gripper's behavior in order to achieve some more complicated target shape, where the targets are shown in light blue. In the real world, we collect the data by first resetting the shape of the plasticism and then randomly applying gripping actions to deform the objects. Because of the use of particle representation and the inductive bias introduced by the graph neural networks, our model can capture the structure of the underlying systems and learn the model from just 10 minutes of real-world interaction data. Here is a manipulation process of deforming the plus systems into long trivial target shapes of A and X. The learn model can help the agents plan the gripper's behavior in order to get the shape of the plus systems closer to the target. As promised, here is a comparison with human subjects manually operating the robots doing the same task. The task is indeed challenging that human subjects would also have trouble perfectly aligning with the target shapes by teleoperating the robots. Our method is comparable or sometimes even slightly better than the human subjects. To quickly summarize, the structure we used in these two projects is a combination of particle representations and graph neural networks. Such structure is particularly suitable for compositional objects or objects with high degrees of freedom. The benefits that come with the structure are the two major fronts. The first one is generalization. Because of the inductive bias embedded in the graph neural networks, our learned model can generalize to systems that are larger than during training and handle target configurations never seen during training, like the letter shapes. The second benefit is sample efficiency. Since the graph neural networks use shared edge encoders and node encoders, which significantly reduce the number of trainable parameters, therefore it allows efficient training where 10 minutes of real-world interaction data is enough for us to model the dynamics of the plus systems and accomplish downstream manipulation tasks. Our work on particle dynamics has mainly inspired two major threads of follow-up work. One is on using graph-structured neural networks to model the dynamics of large-scale compositional systems. Here are some works I particularly like from DeepMind, Intel, and Stanford that focus on the modeling of large-scale particle systems, intuitive physics, and mesh-based systems. Another thread of follow-up works is to use particles as a representation for deformable objects manipulation. Here I'm showing some particularly interesting work on manipulating amorphous materials, clothes, elastic materials, and the benchmark from CMU on deformable objects manipulation. After we have discussed particle representation in depth and its use in plasticism manipulation, we will then quickly go over the remaining three representations at different levels of obstructions and show how they are suitable for the respective tasks. The second task we are considering is the manipulation of granular materials, and we will use pixels as a representation and model the dynamics using fully convolutional neural networks, abbreviated as FCN. The manipulation of granular materials is a task we will commonly encounter in the kitchen environment. For example, here is a chef redistributing the onion pieces. The physics-based model that relies on full-state information would be very hard to use in this case, as precise estimation of all onion pieces states from high-dimensional observation data is nearly impossible. Here on the left is a setup and prior work in our lab that pushes the carrot pieces to the center of the workspace. On the right is a corresponding simulator where the green pusher is pushing the object pieces around. There are two observations from the task. First, the task is more or less 2D. It also has strong spatial equivalence that no matter where the pieces are in the workspace, they are all governed by the same dynamics. Based on such observation, we propose to represent the environment directly as images and using fully convolutional neural networks to model the dynamics. Specifically, given the current visual observation and the action, 
we go through five fully convolutional layers to predict the visual observation at the next time step. Convolution uses shared kernels for all pixels, regardless of the pixel's location. Thus, it is a nice structure to exploit the spatial equivalence of the input pixels. I will later show it allows extrapolate generalization to configurations never seen during training. Here are our learned model's open loop prediction results. The left is a ground truth and the right is a prediction. As you can see from the video, that our model can miss certain details, but it captures the rough distribution of the object pieces and can already be useful when used in a closed loop. Here are our model's control results in manipulating the object pieces into different target shapes. You will very quickly realize what the target shapes are. And yes, the targets are the letters all the way from A to Z. I want to emphasize that this is a very challenging task as it requires some non-trivial redistribution of the object pieces. And the results I show here has never been demonstrated by any other people. We can then call the resulting letter shapes the carrot font. And we can use it to assemble any messages we would like to share. For example, thank you, MIT. And here's the overlay with the target regions. To quickly recap, the structure we use in this project is a combination of pixels and fully convolutional neural networks. The structure is especially suitable for compositional 2D environments with strong spatial equivalence. The key benefits brought by the structure is generalization. For example, our model is only trained on offline data collected by applying random action show on the bottom left, where the object pieces are distributed in a random fashion. It has never seen regularly distributed object pieces on the right, but it can still achieve these targets. The third representation goes one level closer, where we propose to use key points with graph neural networks or multi-layer perceptron for the planar pushing task. Here is a task we aim to tackle. We run the robot to push the box into some target regions while being robust to external disturbances. The key observation we can make about this task are that the object contains much fewer degrees of freedom than plasticisms and granular materials. But on the other hand, it requires more efficient models for real-time feedback control. With the observation in mind, we propose to use key points as a representation for this task. Key points are essentially a sparse set of semantically meaningful points on the object. It is much lower dimensional than dense particles or pixels. Yet, it provides a very nice generalization capability over a category of objects. For example, humans might have different heights or width. We can still use the same set of key points to represent all humans. The story is the same for object categories like shoes, marks, as well as human faces. The other nice property is that it can handle certain levels of deformation and articulation. Manually labeling the key points can be tedious. In this work, we detect and track the key points using a self-supervised learning mechanism. We first sample key points from the initial frame and then track the key points movements to reconstruct the object's movement trajectory. Because we use depth camera, the reconstructed trajectory is projected into the 3D world coordinates. To learn the model, we have to collect the data. On the left is a data collection process where we tally up the robots to randomly poke the boxes around for about 10 minutes. The right is the overlay between our model's open loop prediction and the actual movements of the key points. There are discrepancies due to uncertainties in the environment, but again, it can already be useful in a closed loop. Here are the control results. Our goal is to achieve the target show on the bottom right. You can see the key points we use to represent the object and a small look ahead window representing our model's prediction under the current plan action. Here it achieved the target. The second example asks the agent to first rotate the box 180 degrees before pushing it forward. The model is very small and lightweight, which allows us to run the feedback planner at five hertz. When the reality deviates from the model's prediction, our model can use the environmental feedback to correct its behavior by switching contacting modes. 
This is typically considered a hard task in robotics. The real-time feedback control capability also allows our model to be robust to certain external disturbances. Here, we have a human subject poke the box around. Our agent can correct the deviation and still achieve the targets reliably. Here is another example. In this work, the structure we use is a combination of key points with a simple multi-layer perceptron, but we could also use graph neural networks. The structure allows us to learn very efficient models for objects with fewer degrees of freedom than plasticisms or granular materials. The resulting systems can then support real-time visual model predictive control and be robust to aggressive external disturbances. The benefits are again on the two major fronts. The first one is sample efficiency, and the second one is generalization. We can learn a reasonably good model with just 10 minutes of offline interaction data, and our system can achieve target configurations that are outside the workspace we collected the data on. Until now, the three representations we have discussed mainly focus on generalization to systems larger than during training or unseen target configurations. The type of generalization we focus on for the fourth task is different from the previous three. We focus on generalization across viewpoints, especially for complicated systems involving the interactions between fluid and the rigid objects. I will show how the combination of latent space dynamics model with volume rendering can deliver such generalization. Here are the systems we aim to model. The environments involve complicated physical interactions between the fluid and the container and the rigid objects. We assume we only have access to RGB images. We hope to learn representations such that no matter where you view the environment from, you will always have a good understanding of the underlying 3D contents and be able to make future predictions and synthesize visual observations from novel viewpoints. One way of doing it is what's commonly used in model-based reinforcement learning, that the model first maps the visual observation into a latent vector D. Then a decoder implemented as a convolutional neural network maps the latent representation back to the visual observation to ensure that D encodes non-trivial information about the underlying environment. In order to generalize a course viewpoint, to our method, also proposed to input to the decoder a viewpoint that asks the model to render visual observations from different viewpoints based on the same Z. Here is how the result looks like. When the query viewpoint is within the training distribution, the CN decoder is actually doing a reasonable job. However, as soon as the query viewpoints are from outside the training distribution, here the camera is placed higher closer and looking more downwards towards the fluid containers. The rendered result from CNN failed to match the ground truth. Instead, it might just retrieve some neighboring images from the training set. Convolutional neural networks are known to be very good at handling 2D images, but not good at encoding 3D invariances. Yet, the image generalization process from scene representation is essentially a rendering process and we know a lot about rendering from graphics. So we are asking the question, can we replace the decoding function with a more structured model class that is better at handling 3D transformations? The structure we are using for the decoding function in this work is differentiable volume rendering, which is a classic approach in graphics and provides excellent spatial equivalence. It has also been shown to have excellent performance in recent neural radiance field paper. By replacing the CN decoder with differentiable volume rendering, we'll be able to achieve much better results. Here is a comparison when the query viewpoints are within the training distribution. Our method can generate sharper reconstruction and achieve better consistency in the face of viewpoint variations. The real difference appears when the query viewpoints are outside the training distribution. Our method is much better aligned with the ground truth than using the CN decoder. Then we can learn a latent space dynamics model over the latent vector Z to predict its evolution. Here are the results. The video shows the results on future prediction and novel view synthesis. On the left is the ground truth, and the right is our model's open loop prediction. 
By open loop, I mean that the input QR model are only the initial visual observations and the subsequent actions. Our model has to extrapolate over time and hallucinate how the environment would change under given actions for a very long time horizon. Here's another example of shaking a box of fluid with a cube floating on the surface. Our model can predict the wave of the fluids and the movement of the rigid cube. Here's another example where three cubes fall down and collide with each other. Here are the control results using the learned model. The goal image is given on the left, which is taken from a viewpoint outside the training distribution. On the right is a side-by-side -side comparison between our model and the baseline that uses the CNN decoder, which is also the visual observation inputs to the agents. You can see from the images that the agent's view is very different from the targets, which asks the agents to learn representations that have viewpoint invariance. Here is a control process. On the middle is a control result viewed from the goal viewpoint. And on the right is the overlay between the control result and the target in 3D. Our method is very accurate in aligning with the goal, whereas the CN decoder exhibits very clear deviations. The structure we are using in this work is a combination of a latent space dynamics model and differentiable volume rendering. It allows long-term future prediction and novel view synthesis and can handle different initial configurations and input action sequences for systems involving complicated interactions between rigid objects and fluids. The key benefits brought by the structure is the ability to generalize across viewpoints, especially viewpoints that are outside the training distribution. To quickly recap, we have discussed the use of four representations at different levels of obstructions. It allows us to manipulate objects with complicated physical properties and take robot learning from the manipulation of many rigid objects towards the manipulation of deformable, dynamic, and compositional objects. Adding structure to the model learning pipeline provides two major benefits. One is generalization, where the neural systems can extrapolate to larger systems like in the fluid example. It can also handle new task objectives like the regularly distributed carrot pieces never seen during training. And it can also perform out of distribution viewpoints generalization. The second benefit is sample efficiency. With just 10 minutes of offline interaction data in the real world, we can learn models capable of manipulating boxes and plasticism. Let's zoom out a little bit to see what we have discussed. We discussed about perception, especially what seen representation and at what levels of obstruction we should use to describe the environments for a given task. Then is a dynamics module. We discussed what model class we should use to exploit the structure of the underlying systems. Could it be graph neural networks, fully convolutional neural networks, or volume rendering? Then is a control module. When given the learned dynamics model, how can we solve the model-based optimization problem? However, if we look at the image of humans interacting with the environment, you will realize that there is one very important missing piece of the whole picture, that is sensing. When humans sense the environment from multiple sensory modalities when performing physical interactions, in which vision and touch both play vital roles. And most of the current robotic manipulation systems only consider vision as input. In the next few minutes, I will introduce you to our efforts in bridging the sensing gap by constructing multimodal sensing platforms. To reiterate the importance of touch in our daily life for physical interaction tasks, here are a few examples. For example, purely looking at the image of a human picking up a water bottle, it is hard to predict whether the grasp will succeed or not, as the only touch can tell us whether it is a loose grasp or a tight grasp. Purely from touch, we can also accomplish extremely challenging tasks like pulling keys from our pockets or buttoning our shirts without having to even looking at the interaction process. However, Building such a multimodal sensing and learning platforms is hard, and it involves interdisciplinary collaborations between people from a wide range of backgrounds. For example, we will for sure need people from machine learning and computer vision to interpret the data. 
We will also need people from material science, mechanical engineering, and electrical engineering to build the sensors and deliver the desired sensing information. Working in such an interdisciplinary team requires me to really put my feet into other people's shoes and speak the language of different fields to make sure everybody is on the same page. In a paper accepted to Nature, we propose a tactile glove. This glove has dense tactile sensors covering the palm area. This is by far the highest resolution tactile glove that exists in our community. And there are in total 548 sensors providing continuous readings corresponding to the sensed force. As you can see from the right video, the thickness of the dots represents the normal force applied during the physical interaction of the hand and the mug. Differs from cameras and other tactile sensors, our tactile globe covers a very large area and can exhibit large deformation as we change our hand pose. Here is a specification of the globe shaped sensor, where the dots represent the position of the sensors. Covering the palm is a force sensitive material. The right figure shows the property of the material. When the force increases, the resistance will decrease. The change of the resistance will then be captured by a readout circuit. Based on the tactile signal, we can then use the globe for tasks like object recognition. The left are the objects we aim to classify. The right figure suggests that the more frames we use for classification, the better the accuracy. This also nicely verifies our intuition that the more we interact with an object, the larger chance we can accurately recognize it. We can also use tactile signals to cluster different hand poses when interacting with an object. This is because when we change our hand pose, our skin will bend and stretch. Such movements will also be reflected by the sensed tactile signals. Another interesting task we can do with the tactile globe is to estimate the correlation between different sensors. We collected a data set of a hand interacting with various objects and estimated the correlation between two sensors. The following two visualizations show how likely two points are used together during physical interactions. When we move the mouse around, the colors of other points show how likely the point is used together with the hovering point during physical interaction. For example, the sensors on the palm area are likely to use together and the sensors on the fingertip, although they are far away from each other, they are also likely to be used together. This information can be extremely useful for designing new prosthetic tools. Besides the tactile glove, we have also developed conformal tactile textiles in a nature electronics paper. We have tactile sensors in the form of gloves, socks, vests, and robot sleeves. It can tell us the tactile information of the interactions between the humans and the environments, between humans and the robots, and between robots and the environments. Besides the tactile glove and the conformal tactile textiles, we have also developed a tactile carpet to understand the physical interactions between humans and the environments. We have also used the tactile glove to model the dynamics of hand-object interactions, especially in highly dynamic physical interaction tasks like weaving, throwing objects up and down, playing ping pong, and balancing an umbrella. Until now, I hope I have given you a holistic picture of how my research has contributed to the robot's capability of making better physical interactions with the environment, all the way from sensing, perception, dynamics, and control. I have also discussed in depth how the structure in the system can deliver better sample efficiency and generalization capability. At the end of my talk, I want to show these videos of humans performing complicated physical interactions with the environment again. I will continue the momentum of my research trying to close the gap between humans and robots' capabilities. With innovations and the right structures, all the way from sensing, perception, dynamics, and control, I will take the robot's capability to another level. Then it comes to the end of my talk. Here are just some video highlights of the contents I have talked about, and I'm happy to take any questions.